The Hong Kong Institute of Chartered Secretaries recently held its 12th biennial Corporate Governance Conference. In the following session, two speakers share their views on how to build tomorrow's board. The first speaker is Ms. Flora Wong, Director of Sustainable Investing at Fidelity International. She suggests that companies make profits through an ESG-integrated sustainable investing strategy. She also shares a case study on supply chain risk. Today's session is about how to build tomorrow's board. Um, I think it's a very important topic because um, the boards today and the boards tomorrow are increasingly facing a lot of emerging issues and challenges. You know, a lot of these themes are related to technologies, for example, 5G or um, drones or artificial intelligence. Um, and some of these issues are related to um, changing geopolitical landscape, uh, which has wide implications on supply chain resilience and issues like talent acquisition, so on and so forth. And then, you know, some of these issues are also related to once a century type of event, such as you know the COVID crisis we're living through at the moment, which has fundamentally changed the way we work, the way we hold conferences, and even the way we live. Um, my focus today will be on sustainability issues. Um, now, sustainability means the capability of a business to um, survive and thrive over the long term. And because no business operates in isolation, for a company to be able to maintain its profitability, its viability over the long term, we all need a healthy environmental and social um, backdrop. And naturally, a business that is fit for purpose in a sustainable economy would be those that manage its environmental impact and social impact effectively. And the business imperative of, of effectively managing a company's environmental and social impact is just be becoming increasingly clear to all of us. Um, if you think about consumers today, they are paying more and more attention to what they're eating, uh, what they're wearing, what are the social or environmental footprint of the stuff they buy and the service they consume. And talents of today, when they are choosing which company to work for, to spend 12 hours a day for, they would also tend to um, be more attracted to businesses that have a higher purpose or businesses that have a soul, um, so to speak. And globally, as we can see, regulations are becoming um, tighter and tighter, especially around environmental regulations, you know, things like climate change. And lastly, if you look at investor space, um, more and more investors, such as Fidelity ourselves, we are incorporating ESG factors when making investment decisions. And collectively, these ESG conscious investment decisions will translate into the valuation of companies in the capital market. So as you can see, you know, from all these different very important stakeholders, you know, consumers, regulators, investors, and um, employees, your existing employees or your future employees, they are all paying increasingly um, more attention to these issues, which means it is really important for the board to be up to their game and to provide effective strategic guidance as well as oversight to management in terms of managing these sustainability issues. Now, um, as a first step, I think um, the board needs to be closely involved and provides that um, guidance to the management team of the company to, to determine which ESG factors are most relevant and material for the business because even though ESG are a very simple three-letter acronym, the underlying issues are actually very wide-ranging and each of them can be quite complex in itself. So what I have shown you here is just an example to illustrate how different businesses in different sectors are exposed to different type of ESG issues. Now this table is by no means exhaustive, but hopefully it gives you an idea of how companies will really have to determine for themselves which factors are most relevant based on its business and its future development plan. 
Um, then I would like to zoom in onto one particular ESG issue, which is supply chain risk management to highlight the potential impact of poor management of these issues on the company's financials and the potential complexity of these issues, which hopefully could highlight the importance of board being equipped with the relevant skills and the importance of board being able to devote themselves to, to managing these issues. Now, the company I have um, included on this slide is Boohoo, which is a UK um, online fashion retailer. Just, I think, last month, the company lost more than 30% of its um, market cap over a few days because it was discovered that the company had been using suppliers that had been paying its workers below minimum wage. Um, the message that I would like to convey with this slide or with this story is not only that you know, poor management of social issues can have a major impact on the stock price of your company. The other message I would like to convey is effective governance has to go beyond the formality. It has to be outcome oriented. And the same argument applies for effective management of environmental and social issues. Um, previously, it might be possible for a company to get a pretty high ESG rating from a third party company or even leave that impression um, on your potential investors simply by having policies and procedures in place. But increasingly, you know, investors are doing this assessment themselves and they are more and more able to discern companies that are really good players from those that are just greenwashing. This was not the first time that the company was caught around this issue. The first time it was caught that it was using suppliers that were not treating their um, workers fairly, that were paying below minimum wage. It came out and said publicly that this is an important issue for us. We're going to um, revamp our procedures. And it set up a set of policies around um, supplier management. It established a supplier code of conduct and also claimed that it would start doing third party audit of its suppliers. And that obviously took the boxes of a lot of third-party rating agencies and actually got a really high ESG rating for this company. In fact, um, one third party actually noted the company for its strength around supply chain management. But um, because at Fidelity, our investment team does our own ESG rating, so our analyst at the time also took a closer look at the company, and he was not convinced um, by what the company said because um, when he looked at the profit margin of the company, it remained as high as ever. And had the company truly switched suppliers to more ethical ones, its cost of supply would have gone up, which didn't happen. So for him, what the company said didn't really match with what he was seeing from the fundamental perspective. Um, now, I, I'm using Fidelity as an example here not to sort of promote our own rating or highlight the superiority of our rating. Uh, I'm talking about our own example only because I don't really know what other asset managers are doing. But as a trend, I think asset managers are increasingly um, doing their own assessment and, and relying less and less on third party rating companies. And the implication for business owners or business um, operators is that um, simply by establishing policies or procedures will not be enough to establish yourself as a leader. It is the practice that actually matters and people eventually can tell. Um, now the last example is very much live and I would think quite relevant for many of the participating companies here today. It's about the issue of stranded sea workers um, or seafarers. Um, as a result of COVID, many countries have actually closed their ports, disallowing seafarers to disembark and that made it extremely difficult for um, shipping companies to conduct crew change. And as a result, um, it's estimated that this number is actually slightly outdated because there was a UN conference just last night and um, the international transport organization's new estimation is globally there are more than 400,000 seafarers who have been stranded on board and are not able to go back home for 
um, up to 15 months, I think in some cases um, 18 months, when the regulatory limit is, is around, I think, 11 months, and the industry practice is actually nine months. I think a lot of us during COVID, we had to work from home. Mo and I were just joking that it's so boring because we can't travel. But just think about, imagine if you are stuck on a ship for a year, and, and because they were not able to disembark, they cannot buy SIM card, which means they can't even stay in touch with their family members during this time. So they are constantly stressed, and there is increased level of fatigue as well. And all of this poses severe risk to their safe handling of cargoes. And how important is shipping? It's really unfortunate that shipping as an industry has been really out of flavor because these companies are not really the most profitable companies, and they don't really get onto headlines. And with, I guess, the emergence of um, airlines, people tend to think that a lot of the global trade actually happens on air freight, which is not the case. In fact, 90% of global trade actually happens over shipping. So the fact that we're able to work from home today and still go to supermarket and the shelves are still filled up is because of the service of these shipping companies and the seafarers. So shipping is hugely important and it's because of their service that we're still able to maintain somewhat a normal life in this abnormal time. So apart from, I guess, the humanitarian crisis, happening in shipping, it also poses a supply chain risk for companies almost in every sector. So if you are a retailer, you rely on container shipping to bring the goods to you. But then because the seafarers are severely stressed, you know, in some cases, the captain actually stopped right in the middle of the sea and refused to go anywhere until he was told how he and his um, crew members are going to be repatriated. So all these are potential risks um, from a cargo handling perspective. And if you think about it, some of these cargoes are extremely hazardous, like oil, at, like LNG. One disaster could really bring about the disruption to global trade. So uh, from an investment perspective, we also saw it is a huge risk. So what we did was to reach out to companies in our portfolios, in the shipping and charters, the retailers, the um, dry bulk users, the oil and gas company that use shipping to ship all these oil and gas all over the world to make sure that firstly this is um, on their radar and then for charters it's important that they are flexible in terms of allowing ships to um, deviate from their standard route because not all ports are open for um, captains to conduct crew change, sometimes they actually have to change the route, but then they have to get the permission from the cargo owners first. So from charter's perspective, they can help by being more flexible and allowing ships to deviate from their route. And then we also reach out to our, our airline companies to um, request them to stay involved in the conversation because uh, one of the reasons why crew change has become so difficult is because there has been um, not enough flight, basically. Um, and whenever there is flight, it's extremely expensive. So um, I guess as an attempt to look for a solution, um, these are the things we have considered, which is to ask our companies to lobby governments to designate seafarers as essential workers, because once you are designated as essential workers, you enjoy all these types of privileges as you go through customs, which would facilitate um, crew change. Um, as mentioned earlier, cargo owners can be more flexible in terms of route deviation. Um, there are other things other companies can help out as well. For example, telecommunication companies, maybe you could come up with solutions to support um, test document authentication because one reason government are not willing to allow these seafarers to come in is because the concern around potential infection. And some of the bad players in shipping have fabricated you know, documents to prove that their seafarers are, are safe when they actually didn't go through the test. So if we have, you know, te technology solution to make sure that whatever documentation presented by these seafarers are true, then that would, again, greatly facilitate crew change. So I guess before I wrap up, um, as a request, I would really ask all of you to sort of go back and evaluate whether this poses a risk to your company um, and whether it's something that deserves your attention and 
and an action, even if it's not, if you would like to help in a personal capacity or as part of your corporate philanthropic program, please feel free to get in touch. As part of our engagement efforts, we have been working with international organizations and NGOs to try to contribute to the international efforts to address this issue. So if, if you want to help, I, I'm sure they will be you know, more than happy to hear from you. So with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you. The second speaker is Mr. Lee Wan Lick, Managing Director of Asia Systems Limited. He discusses the implication of new technologies such as AI on board operation, focusing in particular on its impact on data governance. I'm not going to go through a, a broad-based survey of uh, technology and boardroom because uh, I believe many areas have been covered, covered better and you're probably better uh, knowledgeable in those areas than I am. For example, uh, AI, uh, VR, robotics, cybersecurity, uh, those uh, I will not cover. AI, I might uh, come back at the end a bit and talk slightly about it. Uh, but today I will just cover just four points. Uh, two points with respect to the board and two points with respect to businesses. Uh, and uh, wearing both my hat as a having been chairman of a listed company for almost 20 years, and at the same time, uh, as a founder of a company that provides uh, technology system board portals for uh, clients in over 100 countries, and how we have seen uh, across those countries uh, what's been happening and, and, and where the difference uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, where they are, uh, of directors and corporates in the different uh, jurisdictions. Um, so I'm just going to just focus on the areas that I know probably slightly better uh, than, than probably. Said. So let me start with the first uh, major change that we've seen, is, which is uh, COVID-19. So that has driven, obviously, uh, social distancing and the fact that you can't really uh, have meetings uh, together. And that has, uh, for us, has mean that we need to uh, now put in uh, remote video conferencing into our system. Uh, that's very much uh, a, a, a request and a demand from uh, our clients uh, worldwide. But let me quickly move on to what has really uh, ramped up in the last uh, three months. Uh, we have actually conducted over 300 virtual AGMs uh, from zero to 300. And therefore, how do you then uh, run a virtual AGM? And what we have done uh, there have been a couple of observations that I wanted to share. One is that, interestingly enough, the virtual agents, uh, I was told that you actually end up with a better class of shareholders, that turns up. Shareholders that uh, were more engaged, uh, that might not have actually attended in the past, would attend uh, through remotely because it's, it's more convenient. And um, the, the other thing was, uh, 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 obviously, uh, it's not there yet, but there was also an increasing concern about uh, where you, uh, the integrity of your voting process and the integrity of your uh, proxy process. So that was uh, an, uh, an area that we, we seem to increase. Now the other um, areas that we have seen some um, recent interest in, uh, because it, as you all work, uh, work from home, you're increasingly be, uh, using more cloud-based uh, platform. So the issue of data governance uh, come into play. Um, whereas in the past, data governance was GDPR, but now it's actually data jurisdiction. And uh, in terms of maturity, certain countries, uh, UK, they're really very concerned about where your board packs and your board meeting papers are stored. Very, very concerned. Uh, in Hong Kong, we've actually seen less of that. And there are some who ask that question, but lots of them don't ask the question. So that level of maturity in terms of knowing where your board papers are, where they're stored, uh, whether they're stored in Hong Kong or overseas, uh, is less from uh, our interaction with our, our customers. So that's one clear area of, of uh, uh, data governance then. The other area of uh, data governance, which is quite interesting, is, um, and I, I think uh, it might not apply to all businesses, but data, 
companies that you have owns data now because technology allows you to own vast amount of data. So the question of even who owns that data becomes uh, quite important. I have a personal interest in uh, essentially uh, genetic data for lung cancer. And uh, Roche uh, sells you this service where they actually have a database uh, of uh, genetic uh, information of uh, lung patients from all around the world which they collect. And they charge you uh, 25,000 US dollars to, to match again the database. The test itself costs roughly a few thousand dollars. So there's a 90% margin uh, volume on that because they own the data. So there is an increasing, and I think companies and also societies and communities uh, need to be aware of the value of those data and whether you create a national or regional wide uh, database of such data which is shared and not necessarily you know, uh, belongs to a, a, a farmer company in the US, but a database which is shared uh, in Asia and therefore bringing the cost of, uh, in this case, targeted therapy for cancer down to a level which is affordable to, to this region is something that I think uh, will be quite useful for, for you guys um, to, to note in terms of you know, uh, data governance there and uh, simple case then. The second part is um, technology and I'm going to talk about AI, right? Um, AI is not really very intelligent, but at the same time, uh, quite a lot of jobs don't really require that much intelligence. How do you know that some of your staff are going to be replaced, if not this year, next year, in a couple of years? So if some of your stakeholders that you'd be, you know, I guess, you'd be concerned about is your employees, then you have to think about how at the, I guess, the board level, if you are really thinking of employees as stakeholders, how do you cater for them, to what degree do you allow them to upskill, how much investment do you make for them? That was a decision that you know, I personally will have had to face and, and grapple with because even as a technology company, some of us uh, will be uh, replaced. And the other interesting thought that came up in, in terms of the governance uh, discussion uh, uh, today was uh, the sense of how much do you owe to the community? And the reason why they came up was um, the Hong Kong government has a job subsidy scheme, right, where you apply for it. And um, I thought, okay, well, I mean, we shouldn't really apply for it. I mean, we don't need it. But I was told, I was warned that my CFO has an obligation to apply for it because it maximizes the return to the shareholders. So that obviously creates a conflict right away between uh, what some of our fiduciary duties, and, and what uh, I guess my mother would say, you shouldn't be standing in line for handouts if you don't need it. So uh, in terms of that, uh, that conflict there, uh, that there's something that we internally also have to uh, uh, juggle then. So on, on that note, I uh, just wanted to perhaps just give a thought to the ESG and, and uh, whether the fact of life is that in terms of the community, uh, technology has allowed us to work from home, but at the same time, it has actually disassociated and created a, a situation where you don't meet, and so your sense of community is lower. And so, so uh, social media is social, but it does not create a community. And that underlying basis raised the question as whether an, the HKICS and the processes, the governance structure that you put in place to mediate the share of those interests versus the community interests um, might need to go back to what I call the, the mother principle. If you told your mother what you did and she frowns, then that's probably not a good thing to do then. All right, thank you.